For the first time in history, student athletes can monetize their name, image, and likeness bring unprecedented attention into an already buzzing industry, youth sports. A major change is coming to amateur. College athletes can start earning money. With some athletes making millions. It'll be a huge game changer. College athletes can be in commercials now. Dr. Pepper. Here in Michigan, a bill seeks to allow the same for high school athletes. Over 60 million children participate in organized athletics today. The global youth sports market was valued at over $37 billion in 2022 and is expected to grow to almost 70 billion by 2030. However, the industry remains highly fragmented, catching the attention of private equity and venture capital power players who are investing across all levels of sport. The market is primed for a new leader to emerge, making U Sports more organized and accessible. I'm Lion Tree's Alex Michael. Join me as we explore the future of U Sports in this edition of our Kindred Report. Participation in youth sports is expensive. Parents are spending on average $885 on one child's primary sport per season. Different platforms are working towards streamlining the youth sports industry, potentially optimizing areas like management and registration, video analytics, and facilities management. To give us the inside scoop on one of these companies, I sat down with Game Changer president, my friend Samir Ahuja, to get his perspectives on the industry. It is great to be joined today live at Game Changer headquarters with none other than the uh, man of Game Changer, Samir Ahuja. Thank you so much for joining us here. Alex, thanks for having me. Very excited to, that you were able to come visit us. If you have a child who has touched a bat, the odds are not only have you heard about Game Changer, you've used Game Changer. And I think the something the stat was like 70% of all amateur baseball and softball in this country is scored with Game Changer. For anyone who has not played those sports, Please, Samir, tell us about Game Changer. I like to say Game Changer is in the business of delivering happiness to oh, families. Okay. Because parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles might not be able to get to the game. They care about their kid. So if you can't get to the game or you want to learn something about it, we connect you to it. And we do that through our mobile app, which gets you stats, gets you video, gets you highlights. Uh, and we're doing that for 7 million games a year in the United States. The original vision back in, it was just, we are going to an iPhone world, right? Yeah. And, and we are going to take that pen and pencil of putting a K and a backwards yeah. and all the things, and we're gonna put it on a phone and you're gonna do it. And it, it's really user-generated content, right? Because it, you have someone on the bench keeping score just through the phone. But now people are paying to watch the stream of it, right? So tell us about the evolution of the product, it's certainly in the last several years. Yeah, the adding of video streaming was a sea change in what we do. Uh, we still have that core user-generated content to generate stats. Now you're seeing video done in the same way. We're asking the same people, the coaches, to stream the games just using a mobile device. And uh, we've had, out of 7 million games that were scored last year, two, almost 2.5 two million were streamed. And wait, just so for people know, how are they streaming it? It's through a phone. We ask you to put a phone on the backstop in a diamond and you're using another phone to score the game. So two devices, we stitch the whole thing together, you get live streams, you get highlights, it feels like magic. Millions of people, millions of games, this is happening every single day, and we're seeing this now outside of baseball and softball now, in, in a pretty big way in basketball, and you know, and soon in other sports. We've had discussions in the past about the future of video and streaming. There are of course some, some pretty sized, uh, dedicated hardware players yeah. that are yeah. using proprietary cameras. Pixelot, Vio, sure. Tuttles, uh, Live Barns. You have a different opinion as to the future of streaming and in particular the hardware. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, tremendous amount of respect for that model and those companies. Our DNA and what our team here is good at, and it's mostly a technical team, is building mobile apps and software on mobile. And we love the fact that we can ride the wave of mobile adoption and the innovation that an Apple, a Samsung, and we love the fact that that device is already at the field because every person there, including many of the kids, have one or more phones. So you can go with the team. You can guarantee content for the whole season. There's a market for all of these options, but we love that we can get to a really big part of our market. We think there's more than 40 million games in team youth sports in the US. There's no way that there's an economic model to cover all of those games using fixed hardware. Unlike pro sports, Few teams, millions of fans. You have millions of teams, few fans per team. The economic model only works if you can drive the cost of content down 
towards zero, which is like to your point why UGC really works. And Interesting. I mean, obviously there is a hardware market here, so yeah. it'll be an yeah. interesting which vision will play out. Yeah. Certainly there's something very intuitive to what you're saying, and you're proving it for baseball at least, and now some of these other sports. And I could absolutely see multiple visions playing themselves out. Such a fragmented market with so many different levels of play and intention. You have elite segment, maybe there's interest in getting recruited, and you all the way down to just kids who just want to get out and play. Uh, and it's, as we know and have talked about, a mass, fast growing market in general. So we think there's room for a couple, two or three different right. ways to do it. Now, let's, you've talked about the youth sports market. It is quite fragmented. It's, I've always marveled that you can't say youth sports market and say a company, right? right. You could say phone and say Apple, yeah. right? You can say social media, X. Can't do it here. Uh, but there are some big companies emerging. So I'd love to get your uh, impressions on, first, some companies you admire in the space, who you think people should have an eye on because they're doing great stuff in the space, but also where the market's going. Do we think we have some separate pillars, essentially, in different categories? And, but are these things going to have to coalesce? Are we going to see super apps of youth sports? How, how do you see the market shaking out? Yeah, really exciting market. And... Tremendous amount of respect for a lot of the companies in the space. We've spent a lot of time, we're not in it, looking at like league registration. There's some great like Gen 1, Gen 2 companies there. There's some newer scrappy ones, Crossbar is out there, very impressed with the product that they've come out with. In our core space around game coverage, you can't have a conversation without talking about Huddle. Just an incredible business out of Nebraska, done a lot in football. Play on NFHS Network, have just done some amazing things. Picks a lot, incredible amount of sports tech especially around video development coming out of Israel. I know a lot of those people. It's just remarkable to see all of that. I think ultimately the user demands are going to drive this. So families want an integrated experience, Monday to Sunday, before the game, training, getting ready, registering, playing the game, getting the content, and then getting better. And so I think like a lot of other markets disrupted by tech, you'll probably see a, a, you know, a momentum towards super apps or integrated platforms. Families want, you know, they want one place where they can just do everything and focus on being parents, focus on being coaches and right. all the administrative stuff from before to after the game and all the stuff during the game just gets They don't done. want to go between platforms, registration, into yeah. scorekeeping, into yeah. a recruiting profile, into, exactly. you know, that, that, yeah. so you think those things coalesce? I think they do. I've had sat with parents, friends, other people, and they'll show me their phone. They're like, Samir, I'm using eight apps. Can you just make this one app? I swear... And, like we're, we're can working you? on it. Do you think you, can you do that organically or you, you maybe it's selective M&A or how do you see the landscape? I think like many other industries that are in this phase of tech adoption and excitement, there's a huge amount of investment coming into the space, private equity, families, uh, from professional sports, people have been moving into youth. So I think it's a, absolutely a combination of organic and inorganic. As someone who is very much a steward within youth sports, do you have any concerns over participation rates? And, and, and I think a lot of parents feel, I'm a parent, um, that if, if, if a kid hasn't excelled or become part of a travel team by age six, you know, their, their college or certainly professional dreams are dashed. And we are seeing participation rates go down in a number of sports. Spend is going up. But does that concern you? We truly believe sports changes lives. And we want to be at the vanguard of encouraging participation because I think it has life lessons, physical, mental, emotional, that will pay dividends for years. We believe that technology innovation can drive more participation and can democratize sports. It's crucial to us that kids in America, around the world, continue to play sports. I think the lessons you get from losing uh, or for being in situations where you're encouraged to excel are, are crucial. Uh, you think about school or academics, right? Like sometimes you have a good day, sometimes you have a bad day. We see almost, for the most part, 100% it's positive encouragement, positive emotion. You have the outliers here and there, and they'll make the news. Some parent was a little crazy, a coach was a little Does crazy. That, do you, have you have some good streams? Actually, you had you had like a viral clip, right, we, of we, a cyclone or something. We did. This was, this was epic. A kid was up at bat and a mini tornado enveloped the kid. And the umpire- <laughs> That wasn't AI, that was a that real That was not tornado. AI, yeah. it was real. Yeah. And the umpire jumped in and grabbed the kid and you know, effectively, we believe, saved them. Yeah. It's, it's everywhere, it was m tens of millions of, uh, you know, all over news, news stories. Yeah. Uh, that was probably our most viral clip. Fundamentally, we've been talking a lot about how we're adding value to these families. And there's, you know, obviously challenges and all. 
innovation. I'm, I'm just one of these positive, optimistic people. Like innovation will help. So you want more people to pl kids to play. You want more accessibility. T technology, innovation, whether it's in a, the phys current physical realm or pure digital, I think is the answer. At least Create a better way. experience. Create a better experience. Right. Brings more people in. Right. Reduces friction. All it's stuff. just, it all helps. I think it helps participation across the socioeconomic spectrum. Well, I, I, just an absolute fan of what you're building, Thank and, you. and I, you know, youth sports is, is a very central theme at Lion Tree through our work yeah. with you and yeah. others, and I, I think everything you said rings true. I think we're just going to see this profound growth in the market. It's a huge category, and yeah. you're going to have some winners, and it'll be really interesting yeah. to see. So thank you, Samir. Thank you. Shifting gears to the sports media landscape, the creation of sports shoulder content has become an integral part of the sports business model. According to Deloitte, 85% of tween sports fans consume sports content daily. Of those fans, 35% of them are drawn to sports stars for their personalities, driving some athletes to become content creators. For example, in 2020, former NFL player Rob Gronkowski launched a YouTube channel with his brothers, featuring his perspectives on the game, highlights of his career, and introducing fans to their family. The channel amassed over 8 million views in just two years, growing to almost 50 million views today. In today's world, fans are craving a new way to connect with their favorite teams, leading to the explosion of verticals like sports betting and fantasy leagues. 22% of sports fans have bet on pro sports in the past year, and for millennials and Gen Z, that number is close to 30%. Of those bettors, 80% believe betting enhances live sports entertainment. But you don't have to take it from me. Let's toss it over to Kindred Media's Laura Clinton, who hit the streets of NYC to find out how fans are engaging with sports content today. Thanks, Alex. Sports has been driving viewership across streaming services and legacy media players in a major way. Now we're here in New York City to talk to sports fans about how sports betting and the legalization of NIL could impact the future of the sports they love. Have you ever bet money on a sports game? Uh, yes. No, I don't bet. Yeah, I suck at it, so I try to stick, stay away from it. Although, we got a parlay, the Knicks, Rangers, and Yankees this year. So I'm hoping that comes through. It's just yeah. not my thing. I have, multiple times. Average bet's like 50 bucks. I have, and I've actually uh, ran into a little trouble with the gambling, so I'm about a month done with betting. I was doing some, some Bitcoin sites, international, and they like to steal your money. How do you think that sports betting will change sports? Uh, you gotta worry about like things being rigged. It just changed the way that betting went. Because honestly, there was still betting going on regardless, even when it was illegal. This is New York City. Illegally or legally, they were still doing it. So legally, it's honestly better. I think it's definitely gonna drive higher viewership on TV, maybe in-person attendance. And actually, if you watch ESPN, they will have the lines broadcast everywhere now. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's, poor, that's like kind of poor for society. Like, there's a seven-year-old watching. All I'm worried about right now, the number one thing is Knicks, Rangers. That's the number one thing I'm focused on. How do you think that the legalization of NIL rights will impact sports? Definitely is going to drive greater adoption of sports at the youth level because a lot of sports leaders are heroes to young people. And if they can see college students doing that at the non-tip-top level where it's, how am I ever going to get to the NFL? How am I ever going to get to the NBA? If I can get to college and make money, that's going to encourage greater participation. It makes it more about sort of the individual effort. Sort of like, I want to get the, get there to get sponsored versus like being in a team. It could. I went to Duke for undergrad. Jeremy Roach, who's a four-year senior for us, as a fifth year left Duke to go try to get some NIL money from Baylor, which is what happened. And that only would happen because of, you know, the recent changes in the rules. And so it does suck that you have uh, someone who was with our team for four years just leaving now. But that's a part of the game. Historically, amateur and collegiate athletes have generated substantial revenue for their schools and universities. Now they can be compensated directly for their talent and personal brand. As athletes begin to navigate this opportunity, I'm excited to sit down with Mogul co-founder and CEO, Aiden Sayel. It's great to have you on the show. Aiden and his partner, Brandon Wimbush, are the co-founders of a very exciting sports technology business called Mogul. Let's start with give people just a brief primer on what Mogul is. So Mogul is an AI-enabled influencer marketing platform. So what we're doing is the platform matches brands to athlete influencers and streamlines the entire campaign management process for them. 
So it involves performance tracking for their influencer marketing campaigns, fulfillment verification, payment facilitation. Now, the platform itself was specifically optimized for collegiate athletics, otherwise known as the NIL opportunity. So it automatically discloses the activity to athletic departments and protects athlete eligibility within the platform. Essentially, you are a software platform for the athlete. The athlete is your customer. Yes. And they are using it to manage essentially the the – the opportunities that have come in through name, image, and likeness. Yes. Ultimately, we have two primary customers within the space. It's athlete influencers who are looking to monetize their name, image, and likeness, and it's brands that are looking to build awareness for their products and services through mass-scale influencer marketing campaigns. So I'm Coca-Cola or Procter Gamble, whoever I am. I can go on this and say, hey, I want to be around women's basketball Caitlin Clark would be the avatar of it, but there's lots of others. And I can ask them essentially if they will sign on to be a brand ambassador or do different functions for the brand. Effectively, the way that it works is brands come onto the platform, they create campaigns, and then they can filter the entire network of athletes. There's about 20,000 in the network today and source influencers directly for their campaigns. Now, our technology also matches them to the athlete influencers that match their criteria, say they have a geographic location that they're looking to build or they have a specific follower count that they're looking to address, our technology takes that into account. And then they can manage the communications, the delivery of assets, the deliverable fulfillment, all of that directly within the platform. Got it. Give me a sense of that size. So what are some of the highest earners on your platform making? How big is this getting? Because this is all as of what? How long ago did this all? So July 1st possible? of 2021 was when it became formally allowable for college athletes to monetize their NIL. That was also the day that we launched with a fully built product. Um, and it's obviously evolved quite exponentially since then. Yeah. But yeah, so we're about... So three years ago, basically, give yep. or take. Yep. That's not a long time at all. Nope. It's a very uh, short amount of time. Right. So what is, three years into this, yeah. what are some athletes pulling out of this type of arrangement? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways that athletes really engage with Mogul, right? So on the primary side of things, they're connecting with brands for traditional NIL deals, sponsorships, influencer marketing campaigns. Top earners for athletes there are earning in the few hundreds of thousands on the platform. Per year? Per year, so far. It's a lot um, of money, a few hundred grand. Yep. Okay. The average athlete is earning $2,200 a year on Mogul. Got it. Yeah. Across all sports. Across all sports. So if you took the two biggest, which is basketball and football, correct? What is that number? It's generally somewhat closer to, I don't know, 10000 or so. Okay. Um, what I would emphasize is the thing that really differentiates Mogul in the landscape is that we're providing opportunities for all athletes. And what we've seen in the data is that in 2021 and 2022, the marketplace was heavily skewed towards football and men's basketball, as you can imagine. But now we've actually seen the numbers become quite democratic across the marketplace. And there's a variety of things that factor here. Number one is just larger scale of campaigns. So brands are working with more athletes at a time. Some brands are working with 10,000 athletes at a time on the platform. But then also there's been a massive increase in interest in non-revenue generating sports and women's sports throughout the broader sports landscape. Are the dollars that are flowing to those athletes from people recruiting them to the programs or is it from Pepsi, Coke, whatever, trying to have It's them brand make? sponsorships. Okay. So – Mogul is really focused on what we refer to as like traditional NIL. So it's sponsorships and mass scale campaigns, right? And as our network continues to grow and as we work with more large brands that are looking for national distribution at a local scale, that's what we're delivering to them is just tens of thousands of athletes at one time. Got it. And that's what really differentiates us in the landscape. Where are we going with this whole crazy thing? Uh, you know, 10 million is a lot, but it's not actually that much in the scheme of what professional sports make or yep. even what rights are for college football games or any of the bigger sports. Yep. Where is this going? People, I think, from the outside are, are seeing it as the Wild West, different rules, different states. You touched on a little of that. Yep. Where does this end up in your mind? Yep. So I, I think the Wild West moniker is definitely something that we're trying to avoid or um, subdue as Tame. much as possible. Yeah. Tame. Great word. Um, and the reason why is because the media and the headlines will have you believe that NIL is a catastrophe and that it's ruining collegiate athletics. But what we've seen is that we're now nearly four years into this. 
collegiate athletics is growing at a clip like never seen before. The product on the field is better than ever before as well. And sponsorship dollars are flowing into NIL at a rate higher than ever. 35% of brands today actually feel that they're going to exclusively work with co college athletes as opposed to professional athletes right now because of the higher engagement rates and the overall better value that they deliver. So where this is going, ultimately, we felt early on that NIL was really the first domino to fall within collegiate athletics. We feel that within the next two years or so, FBS football will become its own FBS uh, Power Five football, Division One, largest conferences. You know your Big Tens, your SECs. Yep, they're going to formally create their own subdivision with a collective bargaining and most likely salaries associated with that. Additionally, there we're probably sooner than that we're going to be in a revenue sharing model. So if you look at professional sports. 50% of merchandise sales, ticket sales, television, multimedia rights are distributed to the athletes. We're going to see that within college football in particular. The rest of the sports, our thesis is that the NCAA will continue to govern them. And the reason for that is the NCAA makes its money from its championships. So the majority of that is coming from March Madness. And the NCAA, in order to continue to remain an entity, and continue to support the non-revenue generating sports is going to need to maintain those championships. So you believe yep. that we will see football, yep. the biggest programs of football, which is like 80 schools yeah, about. Yeah, that's a good number. We'll get cleaved off of the NCAA university program as we know it today. Essentially, really professionalized. Yep. And they will operate as, and, and this is something I've talked about now for about six months of how I think the writing's a bit on the wall that this will be the competitor to the NFL, ultimately. Yep. Maybe not today, not tomorrow, or in the near term, but at some point, they're already starting to run into each other, and the dollars are going to get that big. And as I think people have followed some of our work in the past, college football is actually the second biggest media rights generator to the NFL yep. and all the other sports. So it is a lot of money, and as you were saying, there could be a rev share. So they get carved out. Yep. And they're governed by their own set of rules. It becomes a rev share. How do you see what you're doing in the overall NL NIL influx impact potentially high school mm -hmm. and new sports? Does this start trickling down? Is it already trickling down? Are high school students on your uh, platform, actually? Yeah, so we've started to see it trickle down already. Something like 22 or so states have approved NIL at the high school level. We currently do not permit high school athletes on the mobile platform, but we do see major trickle-down effect. Thank you, Aiden, for being here. Uh, congrats on Mogul. It seems like a very purposely timely solution to what is a very interesting and dynamic market right now. And we'll be watching you and, and the space in general. So thanks for coming on, Kendry Cast. Thanks for the opportunity. As this landscape continues to evolve, the moment is ripe for strategic partnerships, M&A, and innovation to create a leader in this industry. Thank you again for joining us in this edition of our Kindred Report.